Welcome everyone to our family gospel afternoon. Um, it will be slightly different to what we've had in the past, I'm led to believe, so we'll open with a word of prayer, after which our brother Dave will come straight up and start into his remarks, as he will have a number of readings throughout his talk. Um, there will then be some puzzles and games at the end, and we'll close with a word of prayer. So if you'll all rise, we'll open with a word of prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, we come before thee once again this day, thanking thee for this opportunity which we have to come together as friends and family around thy word, to open the pages thereof and learn the lessons which thou hast recorded for us, that it may help us and uplift us as we all walk towards thy kingdom, that it may help us as parents and teachers and grandparents as we teach our children those ways in which thou hast laid out for us, that it may help us and strengthen us to be more better, um, more like thy son and better sons and daughters of thine. We ask that thou might be with our brother Dave as he gives unto us those words which he has learnt from thy scriptures this afternoon. Help us and be with him that they may help us as we walk towards thy kingdom. And we ask all this through thy son, even the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So Brother Dave is going to talk to us, finding contentment in a crazy world. Thanks, Dave. All right. Well, this is a topic <coughs> that I'm particularly passionate about personally, and I know uh, many are. I know certainly for my dad this is uh, a topic that's very near and dear to his heart. And I think personally I would say that this idea of finding a sense of contentment in a crazy world is probably one of the greatest blessings of being a disciple of Christ, of having a hope, because it is a crazy world and there are so many things that can get us very, very down. Um, it's our hope and some of the things we'll consider that can give us at times a sense of contentment that many just don't feel. Um, so really excited to share uh, this with you this afternoon. We're going to start in an interesting place because as young people, often we have this theory, well, if I had all the money in the world, I would be really content. Life would be great. That would be the solution to all issues. Um, I'd have no worries because I'd have uh, loads and loads of money. And so a lot of people try to find hope um, and they think they'll find contentment in money and riches and wealth. Well, Jesus actually said these words um, to the soldiers that asked him, what should we do? And he said, don't extort money, don't accuse people falsely, and be content with your pay. It was a strange spot to start, but actually, given it's the words of Jesus, I think it's really, really wise, because... There's been many studies done all around the world by many, many different academics around the source of happiness and this question of does money, riches and wealth bring happiness? And, you know, all of those studies would attest to this fact, right? That around about, I think, is it, ooh, uh, Craig, which one's the pointer one? Is it the one with the sunny... Let's try this one. Oh, yeah, excellent. The consensus from all the research is that around... And this is a big number, by the way. A lot of us would never earn this amount of money. But around about seventy to $80,000, up until that point, around here, having a bit more money does help. Yeah, it does help. You know, if you had no money, it would be really hard. But up, after about seventy or 80000 Having anything more, it's called in sort of economic terms, there's very marginal gain. So the gain between, say, eighty and 160000 is very little to the point where out here, no extra value at all, has no connection at all to you being any happier. And that, frankly, up until about seventy or 80000 it's helpful, it gives you a few more things, you can buy a few things, do a few things, but after that, no real value. So, for our young people, don't set your life on thinking, I'm just going to get out there, make buckets of money, and life will be good. 
because it's just not true. What is true is that we, everyone in this room, particularly as Christians or as Christadelphians, believers in the Bible, believers in God and Jesus, we have all that we need. And that's the big statement. Uh, 2 Corinthians 9 verse 8, God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things and at all times, having all that we need, we will abound in every good work. So there's this big difference between needs and wants, right? It's this big, in in economics, we talk about this a lot. What do we really need versus what do we want? Right? We can want for a lot of things, but they're not actually necessarily helpful or needful. And I love this quote. This is a, a personal mantra for me. I first read this in a Qantas magazine. And I thought, yep, that's so true. What is the rules for happiness? Three things. It's having something to do, someone to love and something to hope for. And you know what? I reckon there'd be a lot of people in this room who would say, yeah, I think that's true. Because Immanuel Kant was a very famous philosopher. If you can tick all those three things, you are very blessed. If you've got something to do, a a good job that's that's okay, that brings in enough to support you and your family, you've, you've got something meaningful that you're doing, you've got someone to love, and you might add someone who loves you, but certainly you've got someone you love, And then something to hope for, you're pretty special. You're very fortunate. Because a lot of people in the world can't tick all those three things. We can. We absolutely can. In the truth, as we call it, we've all got something to do. We've all got someone to love and who loves us, which is God and Jesus. And all our friends in the family of God here And, mate, we've all got something to look forward to, haven't we? So we can tick all three boxes, and it's the source of happiness. All right, let's change it a little bit. I think this Indian proverb is super profound. A healthy person has a thousand wishes, but a sick person has only one. What do you think that is? Yep, Uncle Langdon said it. When when you're sick, really sick, you just have one wish to get better, right? It's funny, isn't it? When we are healthy, we just add all these other wishes and wants. But when you're really sick, you just have one wish. So let's never take for granted what really matters. Um, If we've got our health Right, A good job and a loving relationship with someone. There's, that's my other three. If you're healthy, right? So if you can sit there and say, I'm, I'm physically healthy, right? I've got an okay job or okay school life or uni and someone who loves me and someone I love, if you can hold up those three things, you're doing really well because when you're sick, you just want to get better. Next one. There's a reason we get, um, we have things sort of, as it were, go wrong in our life. There's reasons some things are really tough, um, trial and suffering. Now, we've mentioned some of these things. In fact, our chairman, Uncle Peter Beard, today mentioned this. And this was going to be a little, my last paragraph in my exhort, but I looked up and I was more than done for time, so I chopped it. Then I remembered, actually, it's fine because it's in my afternoon session. Why is it sometimes that we do suffer? Is there a purpose with it? I said this morning that one of the purposes that helps us develop the characteristics of God. If we suffer, we develop patience and long-suffering. If others suffer, we can be kind to them. So there's a reason. But there's another big reason. You see, Paul had this thing called a thorn in the flesh. Some suggest it was a physical ailment, a sickness. Others suggest it was a person that was really annoying, like a really annoying person that just gave Paul grief all the time. And he says, to keep me from being conceited, 
Do you boys down the front know what conceited means? No, it's a bit of a biggish word. You want to have a stab? Conceited? Ed? No. To keep me from being like cocky or arrogant, maybe? I think you're better, proud, better than you are? He said, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. It humbled Paul. I personally think it was that guy in Corinthians that always said, oh, you know, this Paul, he writes great letters, but have you ever seen him? He's this tiny little fella and he's not a very good speaker. I think that was the thorn in the flesh, that person that was always cutting Paul down. And Paul said, three times I pleaded with the Lord that it should leave me and let me alone. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. So Paul says, I'll boast in my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest on me. For the sake of Christ, I'm content with weakness, insult, hardship, persecution and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I reckon that's an amazing um, verse or, or statement by Paul. Because, you know, when young people, when we think we're strong, and we've got it all sorted, you know, high self-efficacy, I can do this, you've got this, right? What happens? We start to really rely on self. I can do this. And it becomes about us. Every now and again, God sends little things along in our life that gently remind us, you know what? We're not that strong. And when you cut down and things make you realise how weak we really are, all of a sudden the path to true greatness is in front of us because the path to true greatness is to make of ourselves nothing and to make of God everything, to rely on him. And there's some amazing characters where this happened. Um, you know, Jacob... Jacob was, I sort of tend to think of Jacob, it was probably someone like a Uncle Langdon, you know, this strong and powerful sort of guy. Yep, I can do this. He, he, he really, you know, even when Esau was coming and he was nervous that Esau was coming, he had all these strategies. He lined up all his family with those that he loved the most right at the back and he, he tried to manage things and he was clearly, in my mind, a, a, a very strong person. Yeah, And then he had that wrestle with the angel. And, you know, you see Uncle Langdon now, he walks with a little bit of a, um, how would you say it? Not crippled, but just a little bit not quite the same. And Uncle Langdon now is probably a little bit more humble about, you know, carrying beams on his shoulders and all those sorts of things. Because we realise that we are actually all weak. And Jacob, that happened to him. Jacob was left alone. He wrestled with the angel. The angel touched the socket of his hip and his hip was wrenched. He was never the same again. And then God said, your name won't be Jacob anymore, but Israel, because it's all about God prevailing. Um, and he, he limped from that time. But Jacob, if you look at the life of Jacob, from that moment on, Jacob's life... Israel, as he became known as, so much better, so much better because he was humble and he realised it wasn't all about his ingenuity, his human endeavour, it was all about putting his faith and trust in God. All right, content in any and every situation. Now these words, I wish I could say this, don't you reckon we all probably feel, if only I could say this like Paul... This is what he said. I have learned to be content whatever the circumstance. Yeah, I mean, whatever the circumstance. Even when life goes terribly wrong, things are really disappointing, when you're terribly poor. A lot of that was true of the Apostle Paul. Whatever the circumstance, I learned to be content. How do you do it? Well, he goes on to say, I know what it is to be in need. I've been there. And I know what it is to have heaps. 
He he came from a very privileged part of Jewish society. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, living in plenty or in want. So he might say, well, what is that secret? What is the secret? I reckon he gives us the answer. I think the Apostle Paul's answer is this. I can do all things, not through myself, but through him who gives me strength. I can do all things through Jesus. And I think, again, in the context of our words this morning and what we've said thus far, how true is that? When we are humbled, when we are brought low, when things go bad in our life, when we feel very depressed, when we feel down, it's not ourselves that can get us out of the hole. You know, they say when you're in a a hole, one of the dumbest things to do is to keep digging because you just go down further. It's pretty hard to get yourself out of a hole. Jesus can get us out of the hole. He can strengthen us. We ought to pray to our God and our Lord Jesus Christ for their support and their strength. And this is a good prayer too, because it's not about saying, oh, I want to be humble, so please make me really poor. I want to feel pain, so please give me pain. It's not about that, because sometimes that can create challenges for our spirituality as well. I really think this proverb is brilliant. Two things I ask of you, God. Please don't refuse them to me before I die. Keep falsehood and lies far from me and please don't give me poverty or riches, right? So he says, don't make me super poor or rich. Why? Give me only my daily bread because otherwise I may have too much, super rich, and disown you. God, I have no need of you. I'm good. I've got my super yacht, my uh, villa in France, my private jet. All good, don't need God, because I've got everything. Or, on the other side, if, God, you made me super poor, you know, I might be tempted to actually steal. And I really would not want to steal, because I know that's the wrong thing. It would dishonour you, God. So, our prayer, I think, should be that today as well. We live in extraordinary luxury. We don't ask to be poverty-stricken, right? But we certainly don't ask for riches because it can make us disown God and that's not where we'd ever want to be. I think, Dad, this would be, is this your favourite verse? Number one. Dad just held up number one. So for Andrew Hill, this is his favourite verse. Godliness with contentment is great gain. So it's not just about godliness, it's godliness with contentment. Because sometimes we say, yeah, I'm really godly, but oh man, it's hard, you know, being godly, I can't play sport, can't do this, can't do that. And we almost say, if only you didn't make me godly, I could fulfil all these other dreams. It's godliness with contentment is great gain. That's really interesting, isn't it? Gain. Look how Paul redefines gain. Uh, Uncle Adrian and I are accountants. Is there any other accountants here? Have I missed Nick? Is it a, it's just a sort of in that field. Um, Anyone else? Rachie works for accounting firm. Where's Shane? There he is, another one. I couldn't see you back there. We talk about things like profit and loss and you make a gain on a sale. You buy a house for 100,000, sell it for 110, you make a gain. We often think about gains and profits in financial terms. Whereas Paul's here playing on that because he said being content, which often people think about money, Real contentment, real gain is in this. So he says, godliness with contentment is great gain. That's the best gain, that's the best profit on the bottom of the profit loss statement you can ever have. For we brought nothing into the world, we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we should be content with that. Those who want to get rich, look at that, it's not those who are rich, those who want it, they're always wanting, 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 fall into temptation and a trap, into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. And then it says, for money is the root of all evil. Is that what it says, Darcy? Money is the root of all evil. Have you heard that? No, you're wrong. Read it again. 
Ed, what does it say, Darcy? The love of money, right? That's interesting, isn't it? It's not money is not evil. That's what we sometimes hear. Money is the root of all evil. It's actually the love of it. So even if you don't have it, if you love it so much you'd want loads of it, that's just as big a problem as if you have it. Because some people that have it, doesn't, it's not such a big deal to them. Yeah. So it's the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money, they've wandered from the faith because the priority is all just about money. I'll be super happy if I've got that private jet, that private island and all those things, yeah? Which is dumb because all the research says after you've got $70,000, nothing more, right? Now, that's still hard to get to $70,000. I'm not underplaying that. But some people want millions and millions and kajillions. Yeah, if you heard about that one? Kajillions, that's the new term. Um, but you, man of God, flee from all of this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance and gentleness. Now, I found a nice picture of Ollie um, to share with you. There he is. <laughs> Uh, actually, it's not Ollie. Um, I just thought I'd say that. But um, it's Eddie. No, it's neither of them. Um, did you notice how tall Ed was when he walked into the hall? He's uh, grown a bit, hasn't he? Big boy. But it's a very true statement. Now, I certainly personally hope I don't go out of this world naked. Uh, I hope I've got clothes on at the time. Um, but... In a sense, what the writer here in Job is saying is totally true. Naked, we came into the world, that's definitely true. And in the sense of naked, we'll go out of it, is true. It doesn't mean you'll actually be naked, but it means you'll go out with nothing because you can't take it with you, yeah? You can't take your mansion down into the grave. The Centennial Park wouldn't be big enough, mansion. So when you leave this world, you go with nothing. So it's sort of funny, isn't it, really? It's very silly that we spend all our life trying to get loads and loads of possessions, not one car, two, three, not one house, two, three, four, better stuff, bigger and better stuff all the time. But the point is, naked we came in, naked we're going out. So we don't vest in that. It's not all about that stuff because we have to leave it all behind. Now, that's a bit of a tricky picture. Can someone down the front, what do you think that picture is on the right-hand side? Pillar of salt. Pillar of salt. Yeah, it is. So it's a, a lady here, sort of wearing a dress, and there's this wind, and she's turned in, that's all salt, like crystals. So that's Lot's wife, because she couldn't leave it behind. You remember the Sunday school story of Lot's wife? They got called out, and they went, but Lot's wife, she was, uh, nah, I would really like to go back there to Sodom and Gomorrah. It was a bit like in the wilderness wanderings. They left Egypt, but some people wanted to go back. And um, Jesus says quite soberingly that the time when he returns is going to be very similar. It's going to be the same in the days of, like it was in the days of Lot. People were eating, drinking, which we do a fair bit of buying and selling all the time, planting and building. But the day, the very day when Lot left Son, all the fire and the sulphur came down, destroyed them all. It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man comes. On that day, no one who's on his housetop should go back inside. Remember Lot's wife. So the point is, Lot's wife couldn't leave it behind. So a great test for us young people, and frankly, more for us older ones, is can we leave it behind? Would we be prepared to just say, yep, my heart's desire is here. We were chatting with uh, Ed and Luce and Ollie about all the different ways Jesus might return. Will it be an angel? Would it be someone that's resurrected? We all, we all had different theories, didn't we, about what it will be like when Jesus comes back. How will he tell us? Well, the big question is not necessarily how we'll know, it's how will we react? Will we be, yes, my dreams have come true, I want to go, or we'll be saying, oh, well, I was looking forward to that holiday in Noosa, or 
you know, my new mountain bike or something like that because we're so vested in this life. We, don't, we actually feel we've got it pretty good and it would be hard to leave behind. Next one is about abundance of possessions. I find this particular verse quite confronting personally and I reckon if we're honest it's, it's a confronting passage for many because a lot of us have this notion of wanting to get ahead, you know, we want to get ahead, pay off our mortgage, those sorts of things and that's good, I mean it's not a bad thing. But if it goes beyond that, these are uh, very confronting words from uh, Jesus. He said to them, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life doesn't consist in the abundance of stuff, things, possessions that we have. He told them a parable, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do now? It's going so well. So he said, I've got no place to store my crops. And he said, well, this is what I'll do. I'll rip down all my barns because they're too small and I'll build lots of bigger barns and that's where I'll store my surplus grain. And look what he says to himself, the great delusion of riches. This is the delusion of setting our heart on the things of this world. The guy says to himself, I'll say to myself, You have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Your superannuation looks fantastic. Take life easy. Eat, drink and be merry. Easy street. Sorted now. Sorted. I've got a million dollars in super. Um, Paid off my house. I'm sorted. Life's good. The holy grail. I've reached it. A lot of people in the world think exactly like that. Virtually all of my work colleagues would think like that. And as I said, some of that in the right balance is not bad. But but Jesus says in this analogy, God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded of you, then who who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. And think about that, hey? I mean, we could spend our life being like this fellow here, building bigger and better barns, getting more and more stuff, and then bang, Christ returns, end of story, no further opportunity, and how much will all that stuff matter to us? Not at all. It won't matter anything to us. If anything, we would be left with a feeling of regret that we didn't put our focus where it really counts. Yeah. Or, or, or your account's closed, yeah. Absolutely, whether it's a tragic accident or a, a heart attack and, and it's over. You don't, may not ever even have that chance to sit back and say, life's great. Whatever were gains to me, this is again, Paul, I, I'm, you know, we're always in awe of how the Apostle Paul kept all things in control. Whatever were gains for me, I now consider them loss for Jesus. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ, my Lord. For those for whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. Look at that. He's using, again, those expressions like profit and loss. Everything that's gain is about God and Jesus and the hope of the Bible. Loss, garbage, is the things of this world which won't ultimately stand for anything. They won't matter in the end. Amazing perspective. Now, Who's heard the little story about the rich businessman and the poor fisherman? One person, two people, three people, a few, four, five, six. There we go. I first learnt about it um, when we went to the Solomon Islands. Um, I got told this story because it probably is a tad, there's a tad, it doesn't need to be, but there maybe is almost a racial element to it, but uh, it's not designed for that intent. But I'll tell the story as best I can, right? So... And excuse if, if I use the reference to someone from an island, it's, not, it's, it's all about more having money and not having it. So there's this rich American businessman and uh, he goes, let's call it, let's, let's say that Solomon Islands. And uh, in the islands, um, uh, off the Solomon Islands, there's a, a fellow there who's a poor fisherman. 
sitting at the end of the little jetty and I've literally seen this day, you would have seen it many times in the Solomons, they sometimes just have a, a glass jar, Dad you would have seen it, um, with string wrapped around it and they've made a little hook and they're fishing but because there's abundance of fish they're doing well, they're catching fish. And this uh, American businessman comes along and sees this fellow catching fish and he's like amazed, there's fish everywhere, big fish, it's going, it's going off, crazy. And the American businessman says to this, uh, this uh, poor sort of islander fisherman, he says, well, you know, this is amazing. You know, you're doing so well, you know, we should, uh, we, 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 we should, we should go into business here. You know, we, 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 could, uh, we could get some boats and we could go out a little further where the fish are bigger and you and me will we'll, we'll recruit a whole bunch of people and we'll have a flotilla out there and we'll catch loads of fish and we'll, we'll, we'll set up a factory here to process the fish like in Port Lincoln and we'll, we'll, we'll do amazing. It'll be incredible. It will be so good. We'll make so much money and, you know, you, you can really do something here. We'll do something together. And the little islander, poor fisherman, says, and well, what... Once we've done all that and achieved all of that, what would we do? What, 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 what's the value? And he said, well, just imagine. You know, you could just, you would never care in the world. You could just, you could just sit there on, on, on the end of a jetty and hang a line in and life would just be amazing. And the islander says, well, uh, I'm doing that right now. <laughs> yeah? So the point is, sometimes we think that there's going to be some rainy day, some rainbow pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, that if we do all of this... You know, it's sort of funny, isn't it, really, that, no disrespect to any of the grey nomads in the room, we bust our gut all our life when we're actually fittest and healthiest to make loads of money to then be grey nomads when we can't do as much and travel the world. <laughs> it's a funny thing, really, isn't it? The point is, enjoy the journey. I mean, this is a more practical thing. Enjoy life, all aspects of life. Don't store it all on the end. Enjoy the life like this island fisherman. Be content with what we have. Hebrews 13, verse 5. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. I remember... James Flint saying to me once that even in all the difficulties of the poverty, and he is, James, I know, used to a lot, still does struggle um, when you do see some of our wonderful brethren and sisters suffer. But he said that verse still holds true. God, they find a way, whether it's through us or God's... Um, Intervention. God will never leave you or forsake you if we place our trust in him. And I just thought I would use a few psalms. I'm, I'm happy to leave these slides on Quadra. In fact, you've got them because um, we won't go forever. But David and the psalms are full of these amazing um, statements of faith. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I don't want for anything. Do not fret because of those who are evil or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they'll soon wither away and perish. Yeah, we don't need to envy those that have everything because envy makes us feel discontented, uncontent, because we wish we had what they had. If only I had what they had, I would be happy. Our reading this morning, Psalm 73, Asaph, he got real stressed out. The wicked are all prospering, I'm not. He went into the sanctuary, it says he realised the end, they'll die and that's it. Whereas when we die, we have a hope. And you know what? Don't worry. Um, I used to really kind of like that song, uh, Shane would be better singing it, or Rachel. You know that song, uh, Don't Worry, Be Happy, you know that one? Um, it was a cool little song, just a happy little song. Um, do you know that song? Have you heard that song? Oh, you've heard that, Tim. That's amazing, because it's a very old song. Maybe Phil plays a few of his old records on his turntable. Sorry, Phil. Or CDs. Um, but it's a cute little song. Don't worry, be happy. And actually the Bible says pretty much that as well. Matthew 6, verse 25. Therefore I tell you, 
Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you'll wear. Don't stress about all those things. Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? You know, Tim, worry, 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 add an hour? No, you probably lose a bunch of hours because stress and anxiety and all that worry probably means you may not live longer. Why do you worry about your clothes? Do, do, the, do the flowers worry about how beautifully they're clothed? No, they don't. God feeds them. Um, so then, skipping down to the end, don't worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For everyone else worries about these things. Your heavenly Father knows you need them. He will provide, but for you, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all those things will be added unto you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. It's pretty practical advice, isn't it? Every day has enough grief not to worry even more about, about it. Um, tomorrow will worry about itself. And I'll talk about that in my final slide. I learned a wonderful lesson from Lizzie's uh, grandma in that regard, which I'll share with you. As for climbing the ladder, wanting to always be bigger, better, better title, more titles, um, to flatter your ego, what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world and forfeit your soul? Yeah. So you're the next Jeff Bezos, CEO of Amazon, then you die. 100 years later, who's Jeff Bezos? Never heard of him. Um, is he still enjoying all his... What is it, Matty? Trillions these days? He's the richest man in the world. He probably doesn't know even how to, know, how to spend it. How do you spend several trillion? You don't. And is that a good thing, that one man should have trillions? No. Um, but at the end of the day, if you're not going to live forever, big deal. How much fun can you actually have in 80 years? A fair bit. But how much fun can you have in millions, billions of years? A lot more. So... Climbing the ladder, I mean, there's a dude there in uh, New York City probably, climbing the ladder, it's pretty precarious, you'll probably fall off as most people do that try and climb the ladder, but ultimately you might fall for your soul. It's a mug's game, doesn't end well. Be happy. I love it in the Bible actually, there's a great deal of verses, now I acknowledge some of these are not necessarily directed to us as believers or followers of Jesus, but the Bible doesn't say you need to be sombre, live a really terrible life, always like in a monastery, right, denying everything. In fact, the opposite. God often says, be happy, like for you young people, right? Let's have a look at some of these guys. He's a smiley fella, isn't he? I found that one thought, yep, that's a nice grin. Better a little with the fear of the Lord than great wealth with turmoil. Death and destruction are never satisfied, neither are human eyes. You'll never be satisfied. You, you know, as soon as someone that buys a mega yacht that's bigger than the other fella that had the biggest mega yacht, they have to then get a big, bigger one built, right? You never stop. It's not like you go, sort it now, I've got a 100-foot yacht, I'm done. No, because then you park it in Santorini next to someone that's got 120 and you want 125. It's crazy. It's never satisfied. The Bible tells us that. But then I like these things that the Bible says. A person can do nothing better. You know, I mean, this is often how Lizzie and I think. A person can do nothing better than to eat and drink, find satisfaction in your toil. When we lived at Bridgewater, we were, you'd flog yourself in the garden all day and then you'd sit down and have a pizza and a Coke or something and it feels good. Yeah? Do you know what I'm, you know what I'm saying? It feels good. That's what the Bible says. A person can do nothing better to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their toil. This too I see is from the hand of God. For without, who can eat or find enjoyment? There's nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live. How's this? Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. Yeah? The best thing to do, it's appropriate for a person to eat, to drink, find satisfaction in their toilsome labour under the sun... Yeah, you know, Uncle Langdon, when you would have an early start for a concrete pour and it goes well and you work the day, you go home and you go, ah, that feels good, it went well. And sometimes me smashing the keyboard, finally getting on top of my inbox, feels good. Yeah, it's a bit weird, but it feels good. 
because you've worked hard and you've got on top of it. For this is their lot. Moreover, when God gives you something great, some good wealth and possessions, and the ability to enjoy them, accept your lot and be happy about it. It's a gift from God. Always thank God. And the others are fairly similar, so we'll skip them. I thought they're really nice verses, though, because it's really true. Um, that sometimes the simple, life, simple things in life are often the best. Now, I reckon Uncle Adrian used to use this expression when we were kids. Does that ring a bell? Uh, probably does to Rach and Shane. Keep it simple, stupid. I learnt that going to the Farron's house. The kiss, kiss principle. Has anyone never heard that principle before? Be honest. Okay, it's old-fashioned, Uncle Adrian. The young ones have never heard it before in their lives. Uh, some of the oldies have heard it. Kiss. So remember this. Not about kissing girls or boys. Keep it simple, stupid. Now... Uncle Adrian probably substituted stupid because we're not all stupid, but keep it simple, stupid. It's quite good. So here's my uh, attempt at the 12 KISS principles for contentment, okay? And we'll run through these. It's a bit of fun. First, in your life, in our lives, try and just keep it simple to three things. Worry about your family, the ecclesia and work. End of ball game. Don't be stressing about your big share portfolio. Don't be playing the market and adding all that stuff. Just have an honourable job. Focus on your wife or your children and, and husband and your work in the ecclesia. Three things. Keep it simple. Don't overcomplicate your life. Live within our means. Very simple again. You know, when we try desperately always for a better car, better house... We overextend, we overcommit, all of a sudden we're up to our eyeballs in debt. Guess what happens? You add all this stress. It's not necessary. I'll give you the strong tip. When you've got all that stuff and something goes pear-shaped in your life, guess what you want? A pair of tracky dacks and a pizza and a simple life away from anything. All the, the, the grief that goes with any form of status. You just want to go back to a simple life. You throw it all away for a simple private life. So don't go there. It's no value. Don't sweat the small stuff. That's one of my private ones. Don't sweat the small stuff. There's so much small stuff. People stress. It's not worth it. Even at the ecclesial level, let's realise what the big stuff is and the small stuff. Don't sweat it. In relationships, don't sweat it. OK, I left the towel on the floor again. I'm sorry. It's not World War Three. it's the small stuff. <laughs> I just poked the bear then. Uh, that's why I bought 12 red roses this morning. Anyway. Don't let our food go cold worrying about what's on everyone else's plate. Actually, what's on our plate often is pretty good. It's pretty good. But if we let that go cold, because we're always saying, I wish I had what Asher had, if only I could have that lobster thermidor instead of this fish finger, I would be loving life. But actually, the fish fingers are pretty good. If you let them go cold, they won't be very good, because you're just obsessed with Tim's lobster thermidor. Um, so don't let your good food go cold, worrying about everybody else's Flash of food. Now, I reckon Uncle Langdon said something similar to this before to me. It hurts to let go, but sometimes it hurts more to hold on. It's a bit deep, isn't it? You with that one, Ed? You get it? Sometimes it hurts to let go of something and move on but sometimes it hurts more to hold on to that painful thing. Sometimes it's best to just let go and move on. That's a bit of a deeper one. No matter how dark the night, the sun will always rise the next day. And that's the one I learnt from Lizzie's grandma. Um, how amazing a woman who died the very next day she, she knew she was going to die. She was lying there um, 
incredibly calm, incredibly peaceful. And poor uh, Robin, Lizzie's mum, was really sad. She knew she would see Auntie Dot again, but she's sad that her mum was going to pass. It was almost like it could have happened at any moment. And she gently, as anyone who knew Annie Dot Waite, the softest spoken, she's like the Queen, wasn't she? Just a beautiful lady. She said, Robin, the sun will always rise in the morning. No, don't worry. And then she said, straight after that, like five minutes later, she said, Robin, there'll always be goodbyes and there'll always be hellos. And I just thought, mate, Imagine, I so wish to be able to have that faith right the night before I was to die. She, she was so, she just was, she was in the kingdom, like in terms of her mindset. No fear, no pretense, just quiet, gentle reassurance. Amazing. So no matter how stressed or when you come home, I've had a bad day, kick the cat, all that sort of stuff. You know what? You wouldn't kick your cat, would you, Tommy and Will? I heard you react to that, because you love your cat. Um, The sun will always rise in the morning. It's not that bad, and we'll talk about that in our closing one of this list. Seven, when we stop striving for what we want, we find what we really need. Often what we really need is there in the arms of our wife, the hug of our child, the enjoyment of a simple meal with friends or whatever, but sometimes we want that. We want what he's got. If only I had Kimbo's beautiful four-wheel drive, everything would be great. But you don't need that. You've got a great car yourself. Or whatever it is, you you often don't realise what you need is right there when you're focusing on everything you want that everyone else seems to have. No one on their deathbed ever said... I wish I spent another day in the office, yeah? Do you reckon, Uncle Adrian, would that be come to mind? No. Yeah, exactly. Nobody said that. I wish I had done a few more hours of overtime. I wish I had got that promotion or whatever. On, on your deathbed, generally, the things that matter to you are the things that really matter. I wish I had spent more time with my family. I wish I had spent more time with my children. I wish I had been, you know, more sincere about my faith or whatever it is, yeah? So don't put in our lives first the things that on our deathbed would be last, yeah? Number nine. This is actually... Where do you think that comes from, Ed? Have you um, heard that before? Number nine. God grant me... The serenity to accept the things I cannot control, you know? It's actually uh, the prayer that people use at Alcoholics Anonymous. Did you know that? It's interesting. Um, pardon? No, that's probably why you don't know. But uh, um, it's, a, it's a great prayer, though, that sentiment. God grant me the serenity, the peace of mind to accept the things I can't control. That's the big, one of the biggest secrets to contentment. There are many things outside of our control. And contentment is realising that certain things I can't control, which goes to that point of letting go. We find contentment when we let go and let God. I can't control that. Give us, please, God, the serenity to accept those things I can't control. I don't like them sometimes, but please give me the serenity to accept them. (coughs) Who remembers the could have been champions? Anybody? Please, Maddie, thank you. Oh, Wendy, of course. Anyone else? No. Dave, a little bit. What was uh, Dad used to like? The goons. They were a bit like the goons, but they were for... Dad's embarrassed by that. I wouldn't be embarrassed about what, like the goon. But um, there was these guys on the ABC. They were called the Could Have Been Champions. Greg Champion was one of them. Um, that Martin Cover, I think it was. And um, they're funny characters. But they called themselves the Could Have Been Champions because they were obsessed by sport. But apparently, all of them were rubbish. <laughs> but they always so they made this joke about themselves. I'm a Could Have Been Champion. 
being content as a disciple of Christ is not going around saying, I'm a could have been champion. How detestful almost is it to Jesus who died for us to say, God and Jesus, if you hadn't called me, I could have played test cricket for Australia. If you hadn't called me, Liz, I could have played AFL women's W, A, AFLW. Jesus, if you hadn't called me, I could have played tennis like Ash Barty, or I could have been this, or I could have been the CEO of Amazon. But, oh, because you've called me, I've made sacrifices for you. But actually, I could have been. That's not the way to live a contented life. A contented life is saying the hope of the kingdom is far more than anything I could have been, and you just leave it behind, yeah? It's not easy to do sometimes, but it's important. Two more. We find contentment when we lose ourselves in the service of others. If our life is focused on others and their needs, it somehow helps us put our issues in perspective and we become more content. And last one, which is my own personal little one, our worst day yeah, is sometimes for many people, in fact for probably billions of people in the world, and I don't mean like a tragic day, but a day where everything seems to go bad at work and the photocopy gets stuck and you lose a PowerPoint presentation midstream or you get the sack. Your worst day for a lot of people would be a day they could only dream of. It helps put in perspective, doesn't it? It makes us feel that contentment with what we have. I'll leave it there. Thanks very much. Thanks, uh, David. We've just got a few little uh, exercises that I'd want some volunteers to help me with, just to reinforce some of the points. And uh, we've got a team effort going at the back there to put a table tennis table together, and hopefully we'll be able to play a very similar game to Donkey, but it won't be called Donkey, it'll be called Crazy, because David's talking about crazy world. All righty, so there may be some team building going. Um, we're just going to move this, and just need some help to... Uh, Got a couple of quizzes here. Uh, if some of these young fellas could give those out. There's one which is uh, playing with words from Philippians 4, verses 10 to 13. You could just give those out. And there's some pencils here as well. So this is sort of for some of the older ones that want to do that. The young ones can do it as well. Uh, well, just those who want one. Okay. So uh, what we've got is we'll just move this back, I think. Now, I need four, four young ladies with, uh, just to help me for a little exercise here. Can I have four young ladies? Ella, are you volunteering? Fantastic. 
you want to come up as well? It's not very hard. Okay, oh, Lucy, you're into it. Good, good. And we've got another two. Fantastic. All righty, good. Now, what I want you to do is just grab a balloon, grab a colour balloon. And just space out a little bit. Just space out this way here. That's right. Now, what I want you to do, yep, that's great, yep, is just just keep it in the air as long as you can. What time do we need to be out of here, folks? (laughs) Okay, that's good. You could try hitting it a bit higher, of course. (laughs) Is that hard to do, girls? A little bit, only a little bit. Why is it hard? Yeah, and what happens if you don't put your hand up? It'll, It'll fall on the ground, won't it? Okay, you're doing a great job there. So the problem with this is that every time you hit it up in the air, guess what? It's going to come down again, isn't it? That's, that's very, very good, girls. Now, with life, of course, you find that uh, there's things in life that we try and no matter how much we try, we don't seem to be able to make any more progress. You feel you're making progress, girls? You're doing the same thing you started a minute ago, aren't you? Very good. So we're not, sometimes we feel we're not making any progress enough and it just keeps coming at us, doesn't it? Just like the balloon keeps coming down because of gravity. Well, you know what? One of the quotes that David used today was that no matter what happens in life, whatever comes our way, and, and of course it will happen in various ways for different people, one of the quotes that he used was from Philippians 4 and verse 13. What, what does that say? What did that say? Philippians 4 verse 13. Blank. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so, thanks girls. Good job. You can burst the balloons or take them home. All righty. Fantastic. Uh, your dad said that you can juggle all of the balloons. <laughs> But uh, we might not have time for that, Dave, another time. Yes, yeah, yeah. The more balls you have in the air, the harder it is to keep them all up there. Okay, now that's good. Thanks very much for that, girls. Um, Now, I've got another little exercise we want to do as well. Um, How are we going with our uh, words and our find the words? Keep going. Okay, now I've got a a quoit. Who, Who knows how to play quoits? Yeah, we get somebody different. Just maybe, maybe three or four of the boys might like to come up now. Ollie, you could, you can do this. I reckon you've got a good eye, you fellows. All right, now there's quotes here. Now we've got to find a line. So this can be the line. Sort of stand by the. Ch- oh, maybe that's a bit hard to reckon. About here. Keep going. There. You reckon you can handle that? No. Back here is probably. Is that reasonable? All right, now there's one thing you've got to do though, um, and I'll just show you. There we go. So I've had the little word here, content. So I'm going to put this right behind our little coits, like that. And who's going to be first up? Five coits. Oh, go for it, Darcy. You want to sit over here, just see how good you are. Yes. Yes, shorter. Nearly shorter. Yes, one. Fantastic. One for Darcy. Who's next? Tim. Oh. 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 
Last one. That's all right. Ed, you're going to show us how to do it? Do you want me to move it closer? <laughs> all good. And Asha, you're last. Whoa. One. One. Okay, so we've got two have got one in. The others have got four, five closers. Asher, let's see if we can do it, eh? Further, 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 further. Oh, well, maybe the next part of the exercise might be useful, okay? So we'll put these on the chair. Now, I want you to do exactly the same thing. However, we have a little twist to the game. What we, have to, what we have to do is we have to throw the quoits at the quoit thing, but look at this sign here. Crazy world, okay? So that's there. And I want you to stand on line, look at that, and throw the quoits at that. <laughs> okay? So we have to, you have to look at the crazy world, but you've got to throw the quoits. No sneaking out the eyes, okay? Hmm, <laughs> it's a bit hard, isn't it? When we lose our focus, it's very difficult. Okay, so we're focusing on a crazy world. Oh, Tim. <laughs> oh! Yes! Who's, who's next, eh? Who's next? So, see, when we, when we lose our focus on the things that really matter, as in godliness with contentment, oh, Ed! And we look at a crazy world, we actually don't always do so well. Okay, who's next? You did better looking that way than you did that way, didn't you? <laughs> Some of these people are doing better looking at a crazy world than they did looking at contentment. Well, there you go. Only one. So, the lesson is... Keep focused. Is that right? Okay. Thank you very much, fellas, for doing that. So I think it's the old uh, principle in Scripture, isn't it, that if we, where our heart is, that's where, uh, that's where we will focus. Okay. Um, I think what we might do now is leave you with the quizzes to just sort of fill those in and just see how many words you could get or if you could find all the crossword ones. And I think what we might do is just uh, move into finishing off the session and hopefully we might get a little bit of table tennis in for those who want to play table tennis. It's the old donkey game, but instead of donkey, as you go around the table and all can play, instead of donkey, we're going to use the word crazy. Thanks, sir, Anthony. Thank you, Uncle Adrian, and a very big thank you to Dave for not only his words this morning, but also this afternoon. So we'll finish our afternoon this afternoon with a word of prayer, if you'd all like to rise. <clears throat> our loving Heavenly Father, we come before thee at the close of this time together, thanking thee for this opportunity which we've had to have a look at those things which thou hast recorded for us that it may help us and uplift us as we help each other towards thy kingdom, we pray. Watch over us then as we leave this place and keep us in safety, we pray, until we arrive at our homes. Watch over us, guide, guard and care for us in all that we do and bring thy kingdom to this earth soon, we pray. And we leave our lives then in thy care, asking all this through thy Son, even the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.